In this video, I'm going to be talking about Chainlink and what it does. And just like my other crypto videos, this is going to focus on the technical details of the coin. I'm not going to be shilling anything and I'm not gonna be giving you any financial advice. Uh, and just like any other cryptocurrency, if you really want to understand it, I would suggest reading the white paper. So to understand Chainlink, it helps to first understand smart contracts, which are agreements programmed to execute if and when certain conditions are met. But unlike traditional contracts, there is no central authority that can try to alter the terms of the contract or to not execute on the contract correctly because smart contracts work on top of the decentralized blockchain technology. So this is really important and it's probably going to become the preferred way of handling contracts in the future once this gets more adoption and people feel more comfortable with using it. Uh, but there's a big problem with smart contracts. So the blockchains on which these smart contracts run, they cannot support native communications with external systems. So for example, let's say that you had a lease with your landlord and instead of it being a traditional lease, you're gonna do it as a smart contract. And this smart contract is going to allow your key to work for you to enter your house as long as rent is paid on time. Now, how would the smart contract actually know that you paid your rent on time? How would it know that the landlord is providing their terms of the lease? Like, how do they know that they're giving you maintenance? Uh, how do they know that you haven't broken the lease in some other way, like throwing a party or destroying the property? Um, how would the smart contract actually go about locking your doors if you didn't pay the rent or if you didn't meet uh, your end of the contract in some way? The thing about blockchains is that they can't really take in or push out any data that is external to them. They're kind of like a LAN party back in 2004 with no internet. You know, the different uh, nodes on a blockchain can talk to one another, but they can't really get anything that's external uh, to that network. And this isolation on blockchains is part of the reason that they are so secure in the first place. But we still have this problem of how to get data into or out of a blockchain or the smart contracts that operate on them. Because without doing this, we can't actually use smart contracts for anything that resides outside of the blockchain. Like we might be able to use it for exchanging different tokens for one another, but we need some way to actually be able to deal with inputs that are coming from real life and then outputs that are also going to affect real life. Um, so the current way that this type of problem is being solved is by using oracles, which essentially serve as a bridge between the blockchain and data that is coming from the real world and data that's going to be going out from the blockchain into the real world. Uh, so in the case of this rental agreement smart contract, one of the oracles might be the bank. So the bank is going to report whether or not you paid rent on time to the smart contract. But then there's another problem here. The bank itself is a central point of authority and it has the ability to completely ruin the smart contract by either purposefully reporting your rent payments incorrectly, um, like saying that you didn't pay when you did or vice versa. Uh, and it might not even be malicious. You know, There's all kinds of other technical problems that could happen with this bank's API. Uh, it might get hacked or they might uh, go out of date, like it might say that you didn't pay it at the right time when you actually did, or it might get some kind of a bug in it. So because this centralized authority is sending information to the blockchain uh, and the smart contracts are going to operate based on that data that they're receiving, it basically makes smart contracts useless when they're going to be receiving data from a centralized authority, because at the end of the day, that authority is going to decide uh, kind of indirectly, but still how the smart contract is going to execute, right? Like the bank, like I said, the bank can say that you didn't pay your rent when you actually did, which is why, again, you don't really see uh, smart contracts being used for anything that is outside of the blockchain. But Chainlink seeks to solve this problem of the centralized oracles by basically being a decentralized oracle system. So the way that this might work with Chainlink is, let's say that you have a node that is responsible for checking rent payments, a Chainlink node. 
Uh, and this node is going to be receiving data from different banks about who is paying rent and when. Now I know in real life uh, with a bank, you don't, like if there's a bank that you don't use, they can't really say one way or the other whether or not you made a payment. But for the sake of this example, let's say that they can. Let's say that every independent bank uh, can see the activity of your checking account. So Bank of America, Chase, Citibank, and so on, they're going to tell the Oracle how much rent you paid and when. And once the oracles have this data, they undergo result aggregation where they tally up and assess the validity of all of the different uh, inputs that they got and then they will return some kind of a weighted score. Now, because this information is collected from multiple sources and then aggregated, it prevents the data inputs from coming straight from a centralized authority because in our earlier example, where one single bank is acting as an oracle, that bank's manager might just have a personal beef with you. And so they're going to decide to misreport your rent payments. So let's say in this case, it's Bank of America. They might say that you didn't pay rent, but all of the other banks are going to be saying, yes, you did pay your rent on time. So the oracle can figure out, okay, uh, let's say that there's 30 banks in total, 29 of them are all saying that this person paid their rent and this one bank is saying that they didn't. So I guess I'm not receiving accurate data from Bank of America. Um, and then depending on how the smart contract is or depending on what kind of data the smart contract is looking for, Chainlink might just report it as a Boolean value. So yes or no, obviously if uh, 29 out of 30 are saying yes, then the answer is gonna be yes. Uh, or it might report some kind of a dollar amount of rent that you paid um, if say different banks are reporting that you paid different amounts. Now, of course, Chainlink can be used for much more than this. Uh, some common examples that are listed are reporting the current score of uh, the current score and positions of players in a sports game to a sports betting bookie. Uh, because in case you didn't know, when it comes to betting on sports, the odds are constantly going to change as the game goes on, as one team you know, scores more points or maybe a player gets injured or something like that. All of the odds for who's going to win that game are going to change. You could also use this for things like collecting temperature data for a weather station. Uh, so you're going to have a bunch of different data collection points all over your state or your county or whatever, and then they're all going to be going through some API to the weather station. Well, right now, whoever controls that API is basically a centralized authority. So instead of it going uh, through there, you can have multiple different APIs going into Chainlink, and then Chainlink's gonna act as that oracle, and then it's going to report the data back to the weather station. Now, anyone who wants to operate a Chainlink node, they need to stake an amount of link on it. Uh, it can be any amount, but the more that you stake, the higher the initial reputation of your node is going to be. And thus, people that are executing smart contracts are going to be more likely to use your node as an oracle. And if you continue to provide good data to the smart contracts, which also means that you're going to need to be pulling uh, data from reliable APIs, because Remember, as an oracle, you're basically acting as a middleman. You're receiving all of these different data inputs. Um, like for example, if my smart contract wants to know what is the current price of Ethereum, you may have noticed that if you go to different uh, exchanges, they're all going to report slightly different prices in Ethereum. So you as the node runner, you need to figure out, okay, which, uh, a which exchanges are going to give me the most reliable data? Um, which ones are going to give me the most up-to-date data. You're gonna to have to keep all of that in consideration uh, in order for you to ultimately provide reliable data to the smart contract. Because if you don't do that, then you're going to be taxed link. So basically, the more reliable your node is, the more link it's going to make over time, and the less reliable that your node is, the more link is going to be drained for it over time. Um, so to finish up, we'll take a look at some general data about Link. There are currently a supply of about 416 million Link, um, and they have a total supply cap of 1 billion Link coins. The current price of Chainlink is $28.48 which gives it a market cap of just under $12 billion. 
Thanks for watching this video. Be sure to like, subscribe, and share with other people that are interested in Chainlink.